Tonight on the South Bank Show, an essay on pop music and the Pet Shop Boys. Hello. In 1985, the Pet Shop Boys, Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe, had their first number one single, West End Girls. Since then, they've maintained a strong presence in the English pop charts with a string of best-selling singles and albums. Their records have combined dance floor rhythms with a sense of humour and melancholy, which has made them critics' favourites as well as hugely popular. They've also worked with the likes of Dusty Springfield and Liza Minnelli, and last year they mounted a spectacular stage show with David Alden and David Fielding from the English National Opera. They're driven by a great enthusiasm for pop music, but the cleverness of their songs and their image means that they're often seen as knowing and ironic. So in tonight's film, they talk about their own work in the wider context of the pop process, posing the question, are great pop records a matter of love or understanding? When we first started off having success, we were actually more successful in America than anywhere else in the world. I think the problem with us since then is that we are too um, confusing that in a huge mass market like America, you have to put out a very, very simple signal. And um, we put out very, very confusing signals so people can't grasp one simple thing about us. Um, like they know Madonna, she's kind of sexy and got a lot of attitude. Bruce Springsteen who represents blue collar workers and he's really sincere and he means it. He's one of us. The Pet Shop Boys is kind of what are they all about? They're disturbing. And I think that's the best quality you can have as a, as a songwriter. Some people think they're ironic because they don't smile a lot. <laughs> I and mean, that's about it, really. Irony. We always make a joke about being ironic. A sort of Gilbert and George approach. Yeah. Gilbert and George under the arches, that was another influence. I was thinking pop music is best not to talk about art. Pet Shop Boys music is actually organised around taking quite cliched phrases, rhythms, even, even emotions, um, and doing something interesting with them. Pop is always about being new. Pop music is all about um, having strong ideas, having a lot of attitude, and um, kind of preferably looking good, and saying something about the times you're living in. I think pop music is its weakest when it's kind of made by a load of, you know, sort of over 40s who. Um, are very good musicians or something. And I think that's what separates pop music from rock music. And that's why the Pet Shop Boys are very much into pop music. One of the big things we've always had against rock music is that it's people writing for the future. So people writing their diaries for future publication. People are sort of making this record and thinking, it's a classic album, in years to come it will be played. Well, of course, in years to come it, it won't be played um, in the main. Whereas the rubbishy pop record will ultimately will probably still be played in 20 years' time because it's the record that um, will remind you about what was happening at the time. Sometimes you're better off dead There's a gun in your hand that's pointing at your head You think you're mad, too unstable Kicking in chairs and knocking down tables In a restaurant in a West End town Call the police, there's a madman around Running down underground to a dive bar In a West End town In a West End town, a dead end world makes people dance. Pop's, pop makes people feel things. Pop reminds people of their own, of their own feelings. 
And in that way, it, it's, it's a central experience of their life. And when they, if they stop liking pop music, they'll still, you know, hear something on, uh, you know, they'll hear a hard day's night on the radio and they'll suddenly remember um, of the first time they fell in love or what it was like doing their O levels or something. And that's a really, really important thing about pop music. A lot of what we do is to just, is to write fabulous pop songs that sum up a moment. You know, when there was the, those riots in the mid 80s, we wrote the song Suburbia, which is a pop song, but it's totally about those riots. in that journalistic kind of way, and that something happens and then there's a song about it and sort of enters our culture or whatever as well. Pop music by its very nature is something that has to be instantly graspable. It's almost certainly going to be important in people's lives for a very short time, will be disposed of, and then only come back as memory and nostalgia. So there's nothing significant in the sense of it's not like they're creating a work of art. There was never any pretense of that at all. So in that sense, they didn't take it very seriously. There was no pretense that you could do important things with pop music. On the other hand, they also realised that for those moments while it was working in people's lives, it's incredibly important that people do actually live their lives according to the way in which pop codes certain sorts of emotions and moods. And that for those moments when you're in love with a song, the song is actually defining how you're in love with everything else. And so in that sense, they're taking pop very seriously indeed. <laughs> Saturday Night Fever is still one of my favourite albums. In fact, I bought it on CD the other week. Um, I was, um, when that film came out, although I've never actually seen the film, but um, when that film came out, um, I just started going out to nightclubs, went to Man Fridays in Blackpool, and that was, you know, every track was from that film. And so that was really a very exciting time for me. And it wasn't just the music on that album, but all the music was great around that time. I was always going to enjoy dancing and living for the weekend. The seven deadly virtues, those ghastly little traps. Oh no, my lord, they were not meant for me. Those seven deadly virtues, they're made for other chaps who love a life of failure and ennui. In terms of me, I've always liked songs from people who write for shows and stuff like that, like Richard Rogers um, or Stephen Sondheim to some extent and try to bring that into what we do. There's always, between Chris and I, there's um, two very, very different approaches. Chris likes to write songs that are very, very, very simple chord changes. Pananaro is three chords which don't change at all. Apart from the middle section where it just plays one chord. And it's kind of brilliant that, that it does that. Um, for some reason, I like to have lots of what Chris thinks are complicated chords. We've always been very influenced by, in the early days, by electro disco, which was being made in New York, um, particularly records by, you know. Bobby O and stuff, and um, who else was there? Patrick Cowley. We were into, into all that in the early 80s. They used very hard um, synthesizer sounds. It just had a great energy, and there was. Um, you had a fantastic ecstatic feeling when you were dancing to them, you know, and you felt that you could achieve anything, you know. And if you're driving your car, you just keep going faster and faster. They had that kind of energy. Well, we, <clears throat> we always liked gay music. I mean, Bobby O's music, when we first heard it, 
um, we probably heard in gay clubs, it's a very high, high energy music at the start of the 80s was a specifically gay form of music as disco had been originally in the, early, in the 70s. Um, and um, by the mid 80s, of course, high energy music was pop music. I mean, if you think of Rick Astley or Kylie Minogue, it was all basically gay. It, five years earlier would have been gay disco music. Like house music, for instance, coming back to house music, started off in the um, black gay clubs of Chicago, and electro disco was part of the whole thing. And I think um, it's just that, I don't know why it is, they just seem to latch onto these things quickly or even invent them. I think one of the things that changed, which made house music so um, popular in this country now, is that people don't dance with the opposite sex anymore. When the sort of acid house craze started, that was all irrelevant, and so you just basically went because you enjoyed the music. Boys go to clubs and just dance by themselves or with their friends out of sheer ecstasy in the music. It actually has nothing to do with sex, really. You know, you're kind of Desmond Morris people go and go on about people's courtship rituals or whatever. Well, I don't think the rave is a courtship ritual. It's quite interesting. One might think of it as being more primitive. It's, it is simply losing yourself in music and dance. It's not about pop as a critique of society. It's not about pop as summing up an experience. It goes back to that thing that Chris Lowe and I liked about dance music, something that just made you feel something. And nowadays, um, the, the rave culture is totally about the feeling. And that was always the, mo the thing we were after um, in our records, that kind of slightly ecstatic moment you get. Um, which I don't think you get in a lot of rock music. Maybe I think people find it in heavy metal music. Um, and that was always what we were after. And also to bring, to, to bring into pop music something uh, or areas or subjects that weren't in pop music before that. You know, when we wrote the song, It's a Sin, it's a great, huge dance track that really grabs you. It was the first time that Catholicism was in pop music in such a way. I mean, it was three years before uh, Madonna did Like a Prayer. So We've just written a, um, a new song, which is very uplifting, sort of ecstatic type of dance record. And uh, and even then, Neil's vocals tend to sound a bit sort of sad and down, I think. <laughs> I mean, anyone else singing it, it would be like a really kind of up there record, but it still sounds kind of, well, I, mean, I don't use the word melancholy because it's worth yeah, but it's, it still sounds kind of sad so even when it's a very happy song you still have this element of doubt in it that's you know well, it's probably not going to be a very happy ending i love the way he sings and i love the quality of his voice it's 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 straight toned um and he doesn't sound like a singer a singer you know it, it, it's almost like talking and his speaking voice is so beautiful i think that whenever he speaks on the records it's astonishing. And what he's done is taken all emotion out of the speaking voice, which is interesting. You know? So what they do is they write these really emotional songs about very important things and then present them with absolutely no emotion. To me, the voice, by the way, isn't necessarily the thing that makes pop music fabulous. The thing that makes pop music fabulous is the whole package. Does the package work? You know, when Elvis Presley came out at the right time, it wasn't just his voice, it was the whole thing. 
It was the way he swiveled his hips. It was the clothes he wore. It was the car he drove. It was a whole way of life. Uh, when the Beatles came up in the 1960s, it was the songs, but it was also the Chelsea boots and the suits and the cheeky attitude. And when David Bowie came up, it was the way he looked, which, of course, to my generation, was just something we never really got over, that something could be so fabulous and glamorous. Glamour has always been a very, very important part of pop music. You know, by Better the Devil, you know the whole Carly Minogue, Minogue package was working 100%. You had Kylie, the sweet, innocent Australian girl, kind of slightly on the skids, uh, or, or being naughty rather than slightly on the skids, and being rather more knowing than she had been, but not too knowing. I mean, you've got this fantastically bland Maltine Idol. Suddenly, there's a sort of danger in what she's doing. And at the same time, it's a great pop song. It's rather an underrated record, really, I think. I think if you take the glamour out of pop music, you get something rather dull. I would always love to have been glamorous um, without ever really <laughs> getting there. When we started out, uh, the first pictures we had taken, we specifically wanted to look ugly and very un-pop starish. So we had pictures we were taken where we were both unshaven and they were very detailed pictures where you could kind of see all the spots and everything. And uh, we both looked pretty rough. And also, one of the early ideas as well, which was um, Verix, was to always put us into a setting so that the, the, the photograph looked like a still from a film or something. We started doing pictures for no reason whatsoever, other than the fact that, because we didn't really, we weren't signed, you know, they weren't signed or anything like that. And it was just this idea of taking full pages out in magazines in like ID, The Face and so on. And they were just full pages with a picture and then it just said Massive Management underneath it. Those early pictures were incredibly uncosmetic and that's the way we, we liked them. I used to look at these uh, Richard Avedon pictures like Stravinsky and then Avedon did some pictures of his um, father who um, was like a very, very old man. And it was just like, well, these things were like, people's attitudes were like, they had their heads like this. And it was all like, you know, that head in the shoulder stuff. So they weren't anything to do with pop music. They were to do with like a, um, put it, a bigger culture. And that's what we wanted to sort of let in. There was a definite kind of deadpan attitude about Pet Shop Boys. It was all about there being not a lot of anything, basically. It was minimal, to say the least. And that just seemed to suit. It's very much light their performances on top of the pops around that time there's basically not a lot going on and the sleeves worked in a similar way i suppose to the point where sometimes we didn't even have type on the front of them the idea that i was originally worked on, asked to work on for please was based around lots of tv screens that kind of folded out in all different directions and basically it was all a bit busy and a bit too much and i didn't particularly like it and they didn't particularly like it. And we were getting to the point where we needed something else. Now, amongst the photographs I'd been given to work with was a photograph by Eric of the Pet Shop Boys with towels wrapped around their necks. Now, when you cropped this photograph, there was basically just white borders all the time and just their faces in color. So when that was put against white, for some reason, it seemed to work and the smaller it got, the better it looked. And it was almost an anti-marketing device to use the picture and the type so small that that was its strength, whereas most record sleeves leap out. This one didn't leap out, but as a consequence, it did. It's quite funny, Chris going out in disguise is Chris going out without sunglasses and a hat on. When Chris Lowe walks down the road as Chris Lowe, nobody recognises him, but he puts glasses and a hat on, and he's Chris Lowe, pet shop boy. Yeah, it's that thing of inversion. I remember him once saying that uh, for some reason he'd locked himself out of his flat and he tried to get into the uh, Holiday Inn at um, Holland Park, 
And he went up to the desk and he said, do you have any vacancies? And they said, no, sorry, we don't have any work at the moment. <laughs> particularly tend to create a look specifically for photos or for TV shows so I can kind of hide behind a costume, really. Well, I've always liked clothes that were out of the ordinary, such as the, the Isimiyaki blow-up coat, because that was just, you know, completely over the top, and it had a lot of attitude, and, and it was ideal for wearing on a show like the London Palladium show, because... It was so far removed from show business, you know, from a kind of typical showbiz look. And um, to kind of advance that even further, I decided I was going to have um, a scar painted on my face and look completely manic and strange so that when, you know, the family viewer switched on, and they thought, what's, you know, what's going on here? Here's two young men who burst on the pop scene with a big million seller. This is their follow-up record. It's a pleasure to welcome them to the Palladium, Pet Shop Boys! <laughs> When you're performing a song on a TV show or something, it always seems um, phony to be, to you know, suddenly put on this big smile and, you know, your big kind of happy party group and, you know, everyone's having a good time. And because, I mean, a lot of our songs just aren't expressing that. So if, if you were to come on and do West End Girls, for instance, it's not the kind of song where you're sort of jumping up and down and smiling and stuff. And it just didn't seem natural. It would just seem completely phony to do that. Chris's attitude really has always defined the way we presented ourselves. It's not so much me. I mean, it was all his idea kind of thing. And it's, mo and it's his motivation. It's what he's instinctively like. Um, which is funny because he actually comes from a family, you know, his mother and his grandparents were all in show business. But he has a kind of, and, and he even likes that as I do but he can't personally do it and doesn't want to do it because he thinks he doesn't like to present fake emotions. It was just that you were just there and they had to take it or leave it. And there was no, there was no entertainer value in what we did. What about the jacket? <laughs> but he thinks Carlin Black Label. Do you know? I'll tell you. And I, I sort of think that that had a huge impact on what came after. That it was a totally, although it didn't really seem like it at the time. Uh, the, uh, at the time, I remember people around us being incredibly worried by the fact we just stood there. They thought it was most bizarre. I went through personally a, a, a few moments of panic where I, where I was thinking, it's the Pet Shop Boys show. Um, they're really, they're not doing anything in this, you know, six songs are going by and these guys are just sitting there. But then, you know, you'd get, I would get over that little hump of, of, of panic about it and I would think, no, 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 what they, what, what they don't do is really good. And they sit there so beautifully and Chris just, you know, he really does actually know how to, how to be still and how to turn that into something aesthetically, you know, mm -hmm. attractive and, and fun. And so, you know, go with it. It's good. It's interesting. When we became successful, we thought, well, presumably we play live now, because that's what you do. Um, all we could think of was, was we wanted to present a version of the Pet Shop Boys on stage that wouldn't be a traditional rock concert. 
because we thought that the format of a traditional rock concert was a bit boring, unless you were a fantastically charismatic performer. You must be very song, October Symphonies. This was one of their currently interesting, beautiful songs from the new album. We wanted to get it in the show. We had sort of organized this picaresque journey. The way Neil and Chris fit into this was that they were like tourists kind of moving in slow motion through this decaying, Russian, changing world. like a dream journey in a way. It was a collage of Russia, all the sort of images of Russia, the, the ballerina with the revolver playing Russian roulette, with the, the head of Stalin, um, the poor peasants coming in, miming to a Shostakovich string quartet. Just it, lots of images with Chris taking photographs and observing. I have such a small experience myself with, with rock shows. I mean, I've been to see maybe three in total. So I have no sort of preconceptions about the sort of things that may or may not have been done. I think in a way that Neil and Chris found, found that um, engaging in some way. They were, they were like the freshness of someone coming in who had no preconceptions whatsoever. And so um, obviously in seeing, working with Neil and Chris and, and what they bring to performance, where we are creating around them um, a sort of whole, almost sort of, West End style show. When you go and see a rock concert, it's great when they come on at the start. Really, really fantastically exciting. And then, you know, a quarter of an hour in, you've seen it, you've, the show's it's all finished. You've seen one, you've seen the lot. With our show, we wanted it to be like the first number all the way through, um, which was a very, I mean, it was a very kind of entertainment um, based. A strategy that that we wanted it to be really really entertaining so there was endless costume changes and suddenly a huge film starts and um and the show the new things happened right until the last minute and you wonder what the audience want out of it do they just want to look at you to see what you look like do they want to hear you radically reinterpreting your songs do they, as I think is most often the case, want to hear the record being played live to sound exactly like the record as possible? Or do they want to be made to think about um, what you are and who you do and why they're there? We just wanted to break out of the rock tradition of, you know, good evening, Stockholm, where such and such, you know. I think the articles about us that tend to get it right tend to be the kind of 
sort of smash hits type pop magazines where they just describe what you're like and you talk about quite um, facile things like what's in your fridge and things because actually that gets quite a lot, to, a lot out of you and about what you really like and what your real concerns are. Well, I've always loved pop music, and in 1982, I was asked to work at Smash Hits. And ever since then, of course, I always think that's, that has been the big change in my life, and I've been in pop music ever since. And um, it was a great era to be a pop journalist. The Smash Hits had a, a period where it totally represented what was going on in the right way. And you had this huge explosion of pop music with, you know, Duran Duran or Spandau Ballet, but also Heck at 100 or Frankie Goes to Hollywood, and lots of lesser names you might forget now. We were kind of their voice to their public, in a way. When Smash Hits first started, it was kind of like a rebirth of pop music or whatever, and everything became glossy again, and the difference was everything in Smash Hits was in colour. It had been sort of like black and white newspapers and so on that were pop music before that point. What it was, it was about the look of things. Everything was cosmetic. We used to like men like you'd like women. So if people didn't have shadows, there was no three-quarter lighting or anything like that. They were just young people, and they were young people who were made to have this, like, flat, cardboard-like look about them. You know, we were all influenced by fashion magazines and so on. I think at first this was Smash Hits, a lot of it was sort of innocence. Well, as innocent as you can get in that kind of record industry. And it's always given people an assumption of my kind of knowingness because I was a journalist that I don't necessarily have. But what it represented was, it's almost in a part of the Pet Shop Boys, in that um, I always loved pop music, so I had a job as a pop journalist, not as a rock journalist, as a pop journalist. And if you read the rock reviews in the, in the Independent on Thursday, for instance, they are written from this incredibly Olympian kind of attitude by people who aren't really participating in it at all. And then they have this kind of ludicrous balance, you know, that you'll have kind of, you know, a rap record, a pop record, um, a group from Zimbabwe, um, a, a major new release like Dire Straits. And, um, and you'll write about them all from this incredibly Olympian attitude, like you know about it all, but of course you probably know nothing about the group from Zimbabwe or about rap music, and you've never really experienced it. And, and I really, really hate this. I actually wish now that, in, that serious press, the serious press, um, who've written some serious things about us, um, wouldn't, I wish they wouldn't cover it. People have always liked writing about bands who they think they can find things in that the bands didn't know were there. So they've on the whole always wanted to write about people who they thought of as being slightly more stupid than they are. But the Pet Shop Boys, I think, were unique in that they always, that the, the people who were slightly more stupid than the journalists or the academics were the fans. And the Pet Shop Boys themselves were seen as being very clever. And therefore, the, there were two things going on at the same time, one of which was saying, we can decode what the Pet Shop Boys are really about, um, which is not very clear. They're not just an ordinary pop group. They're something more. But nevertheless, you, we were still writing about pop music. We weren't writing about some horribly pretentious progressive rock. It was still something which could be seen as looking simple but actually being complicated. You live within the headlines so everyone can see You're supporting every new cause, meeting royalty You're another major artist on a higher plane Do you think they'll put you in the rock and roll hall of fame? I very much distrust the idea of quality in music. It's quite interesting that at the moment you've got a new Dire Straits album and tour, and so in Q magazine you get a 16-page pull-out Dire Straits special, and it's going to be the biggest tour ever, sponsored by Philips Compact Disc Players. It's a quality magazine writing about a quality group and a quality tour, and it's even sponsored by a quality product. It's not some horrible soft drink. It's all terribly sensible and 
it all seems to represent precisely nothing. Um, it seems to represent some ideal of consumerism. I don't think the Pet Shop Boys have made a critique of the industry. They've made a critique of certain sorts of hypocrisy and certain sorts of ways in which people who are actually, when it comes down to it, pop musicians like themselves, have tried to suggest that they can make music in ways that either transcend or deny the industry in which they're involved in. The Pets have always said, we're in a pop industry, that's what we do. Both Chris and I have a dislike or had this particular dislike when we started of rock music and its pomposity and pretentiousness and its um, disguising of, you know, greed behind social concern um, and its endless use of um, social issues for publicity <coughs> rather than for any real concern. Um, for those social issues. And that was something we always wanted to help explode. And so um, in 1985, we had a record opportunity, Let's Make Lots of Money, where we, you had this hideous pop duo singing. I've got the brains, you've got the looks. Let's make lots of money. You've got the brawn, I've got the brain. Let's make lots of money. And this went right up to, I suppose, us doing the U2 cover, um, Where the Streets Have No Name, I Can't Take My Eyes Off You, which was an attempt to uh, kind of prick the, the bubble of a kind of mythic presentation of a rock group, which is U2's presentation has been increasingly mythic. Uh, it went from kind of Celtic myth to American authentic rock or even pre-rock myth. And so we wanted to present the song, which actually we really like, by the way, as a disco record. That, that you know, when you present like that, it's just a pop song. I want to I think people assume that we're very calculated and marketing biased because we're a synthesizer duo. And in the early 80s, you had synthesizer groups like, particularly like Heaven 17. They made a real point of presenting themselves as kind of being businessmen and strategists. It was all terribly, terribly clever. The converse of that is that they assume that if you're in a credible rock band, these concerns are just way beneath you. You're thinking about world peace and that kind of thing. And um, and I, I think one of the things that's always impressed us about you two is that their marketing is absolutely brilliant. And they seem to have an incredible control over their images. I remember when they had their film Rattle and Hum out. And anywhere you went in the world, you saw this Rattle and Hum, this huge global marketing event. The point is not really so much against you two or, or against ourselves, is that people, um, very, very, people in rock music tend to take things totally at face value or the value of the myth. I remember sort of Mick Jagger, he was slagging off Frank Sinatra, they were saying it was his, Mick Jagger's generation kind of rebelling against all this. But when you think about, you know, the quality of Frank Sinatra's voice and the great songs that he's, he chooses to sing, I, you know, I, just don't think, I think it's completely unfounded. I've never really liked Elvis's early rock and roll stuff, but I always liked Elvis when he was kind of going down the dumper a bit and he was in Las Vegas and he was always kind of trying to rejuvenate his career and he was singing songs like My Way and things like that. And there's a whole gamut of these songs that are really, really strong songs. And, and when someone that's been suffering or, you know, has been to hell and back sings them, 
it just gives an added dimension to, to those songs and you know that those songs really you know mean something some people definitely have a star quality a certain charisma and you can you feel that and you can sense it emanating from them when they're in the room and um, I don't know if it's something that we possess but I don't think I possess it at all really some people can actually transform themselves into stars they're very good at um, arriving at premieres and for instance Liza Minnelli she's she can kind of get out of um, her chauffeur driven car stand for a few minutes and kind of just look great and and look glamorous and and then proceed in whereas I'm really hopeless I kind of, kind of run out the back of the car and in the side entrance because I'm kind of very uncomfortable with that whole star thing Show business is when like Liza Minnelli actually sits and sings and looks straight into your face when she's singing and she's like that all the time and you get performers who can do that and Pet Shop Boys don't really do them. The thing has always been that to, to actually get their eyes away from the camera and to only emphasize certain things. They love their music and they love what they do. I think what surrounds it they find kind of um, pretentious. When I was a teenager, Liza Minnelli was quite important because cabaret was a really big early 70s thing amongst we teenagers. You know, you had David Bowie, Rock's Music and Cabaret, and maybe Transformed by Lou Reed, and they would all be played. Um, it was quite interesting reading John Savage's book about punk, about how they all listened to the soundtrack of cabaret a lot as well, all the early, like Susie and the Band, Susie, Susie the Band, she talks about. And so Liza Minnelli was, in a sense, already a pop figure in Britain. And that Sally Bowles image was a very, was really, really passed into pop iconography at the time of punk. The idea for losing my mind was uh, their idea completely. Um, Neil knows every show tune in the world, um, and Chris knew exactly what to do with it, to make it, to even enhance it. It enhanced the song to have that almost relentless sound behind it. It's like the Chinese water torture of it all. And yet it, chord-wise, the integrity of the song was still there. Or am I losing my mind? You said you loved me. Or were you just being kind? Or am I losing my mind? This is a review from a uh, Rolling Stone special double issue, December 14th to 28th, 1989, by a chap called Jim Farber. Eric Watson's lushly romantic Domino Dancing was probably the most homoerotic pop video ever made, featuring two finely chiseled boys who wrestle as crashing ocean waves embrace them in slow-mo, no less. As such, the video exemplified the mainstream exploitation of gay sex in the 80s, most evident in Calvin Klein ads and feature films like Top Gun. Unfortunately, domino dancing was every bit as dishonest, titillating the straight world with images it could never acknowledge, then doubling the repression by keeping openly gay expression closeted.
was MTV at that time. It was just all this thing of like uh, girls, girls as objects. It was always girls as objects. So we said, let's make guys objects too. Let's make everybody objects. And, or should I say, objects of sexual attraction. So what happened was we ended up with this film that was very successful because everybody, it was kind of like everybody liked it. Homosexuals, heterosexuals, everybody liked it because there was something attractive in it for everyone. In terms of whether the lyrics represent a gay sensibility or not, again, in pop music, we've always preferred um, not a direct, that's a song that hints or suggests something that gives you a sense of opening up possibilities rather than that defines a sort of political course of action. So we've always preferred to suggest things. And also we've worked in an area of pop music, which is also about sexual attraction of the artists. Uh, and it's rather bizarre actually to find oneself in one's mid-30s um, to a certain extent the center of sexual attraction. And so we've always liked to write to a wide audience because of that, because we feel that we're, that we're in pop music and that to define something would be to limit what we do. I think the problem they've got now, and I think it's actually quite a major problem, is not really to do with their own abilities or skills, it's to do with the peculiarities of the way in which the pop market works, which is certainly their last album it seems to me that they were very deliberately writing what I would think of as adult songs rather than teenage songs, drawing on particular sorts of processes about ageing, regrets about past relationships rather than the excitements of new relationships and so on. It's a, it's a shift into how he's, in a sense, placing himself within the kind of emotional culture. And a lot of songs come out of personal experience. The song Being Boring, which I think is one of our best songs, and I was reminded of a party we had when I was living in Newcastle when I was a teenager, and it quoted the Zelda Fitzgerald quote, um, she was never bored mainly because she was never boring. And a very good friend of mine from that era, uh, in fact, my, my best friend really, had just died of AIDS. And so it was a kind of an elegy for him and for the party we used to have in Newcastle. And then all my friends from Newcastle moved down to London. And then what I was doing now, and he wasn't there. And, um, and so it became this very elegiac song. When you were young, you find inspiration in anyone who's ever gone And opened up a closing door She said we were never feeling bored Cause we were never being boring We had too much time to find for ourselves and talk about a sense of melancholy in the Pet Shop Boys. This isn't a, a kind of aimless sense. I think um, it was fueled quite directly by AIDS, which really, as far as I was concerned, came to prominence in, you know, in 1986. quite a lot of that. Um, I mean, there just, just is, you know. Um, and also the uncertainty that the era of AIDS gave to sexual relationships and the possibility of relationships. Um, I think maybe now, you know, we've come to terms with it all more. Well, EMI commissioned research about the Pet Shop Boys. It was very, very contradictory. It was very difficult for us to know how one would have acted on the basis of it. Um, as for instance, they said, um, one group said, oh yeah, all, the Pet Shop Boys, all their, all their songs sound the same, don't they? And then they were asked, why, did you buy their last album, Behaviour? And they said, no, and they said, why not? And they said, well, it sounded really different, didn't it? <laughs> and this was the people who thought all our songs sounded the same. 
and then the fans who are interviewed very loyally, kind of um, in a kind of Stalinist way, they just gave the party line. They more or less quoted Chris and I verbatim. How would you describe their music? Disco, um, because Chris and I in the past used well, as disco. But then it turned out that um, they thought all our record sleeves were boring. <laughs> We've always liked our record sleeves, particularly the white ones. Oh, I wish they wouldn't do another white record sleeve. Um, they were showed the videos, and they wanted to find out what was the most positive image of the Pet Shop Boys. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of research that with the public, the most popular image of Chris and I is sitting in a, um, a front of a car and always in my mind with Joss Ackland bouncing about behind us. <laughs> that's, a, that's the most popular image. So presumably from there we should go on and do another video in a car with someone with a psychopath sitting behind us.